Hello. Um, yeah, so it's a really dull name for the uh, talk, but it does vaguely, you know, do the job. Um, so I'm Laurie. Uh, I'm a production engineer here, a production engineer at Facebook, and uh, I work on a team called Web Foundation, which works after the website, which isn't a sharded service. But I'm going to talk to you about sharded services anyway. Um, so I'm going to start from the very basics because I'm aware that like a lot of us don't run sharded services because you know if you don't need to, you don't bother. So. What is a sharded service? Well, in the beginning, when God created the world or whatever, he uh, invented services that looked roughly like this. We have clients, we have services, and we have some way to get traffic from clients to services. And we ask our services questions, like what is one plus one, and we get back responses, such as two. And one plus one is an interesting query because it doesn't require any in, in real information to process it. You need to be able to understand Arabic numerals, you need to know what plus means, but generally, like any random CPU you meet in the street knows how to get the answer to from one plus one. This is very different from some queries that we'll find in services that look a bit more like databases. For example, my username at work is LCM, so if I want to write a service which implements get name, then it's gonna return the response of, of Laurie. But this isn't something that any random CPU can go and implement because we need to know what is the mapping from username to full name. And this is you know, pretty simple if you have one user. You probably just embed it in your code a mapping from LCM to Laurie Clark Mihalik. However, uh, if you're moderately successful, you end up with more than one user and you end up with more users than you can fit on a single machine. And that's where we start to see different data on different instances of a service because it turns out disks aren't infinite and so we have to have uh, different data on different disks. And so here we have three instances of the service where we've, say, got LCM and George on the first instance and Bob and Lionel on the third instance. Now, this is a really big deal for our load balancers because load balancers now need to send traffic to the correct instance of the service. So when I ask for get name for, for Laurie, it now needs to send it to the first instance of the service. And if I want to get the name for Bob, I need to go down to the bottom instance of the service. And this is the basics of what is a shard. A shard is the ability for us to respond to traffic for a uh, given subset of the data the service holds. And as we've talked about, the load balancers get more complicated. But the key thing here is we're not talking about a given instance, we're talking about a shard. The load balancer doesn't care about what your service looks like, it cares about which shard it's sending traffic to. Now, because this is just a recon, we're going to talk about failure. What do we do when an uh, instance of the service catches a flame and we start to see errors from that service? Well, assuming our traffic is evenly distributed and we, everything is wonderful, which is never the case, we start to see a 33% error rate because one, like one of three instances is unhappy, and so we're going to see one in three uh, requests failing. In reality, though, if we break it down by shard, we start to see a different uh, view. So on one shard, we're going to see a 100% error rate whereas the other shards, everything's gonna be fine. And this is an example of how sharded services can complicate the process of monitoring them because we start to see that we, our average uh, error rate isn't actually telling us the full story. In reality, most, like two thirds of our users are having a perfectly fine time, whereas one third is having the worst time of their life. So how do we solve that? Well, we do what uh, sysadmin, DevOps, and SREs have been doing for uh, 30 years, we run two instances of it. And this is where we get into something called replication. So because if we have a single instance of that uh, data, I, of that shard, uh, we are gonna be very vulnerable to uh, that instance failing. We're gonna run two and we're gonna create a replica of that data. So we have shards and inside those shards, we have replicas. So we have, on the first instance, we have a replica of the first shard. On the second instance, we have a replica of the first shard again. So shard one, replica one, shard one, replica two. Now, how does this play when uh, one of these instances now dies? Well, um, we've only lost a single instance of this uh, shard, and we've still got that second replica hanging around. And so if our load balances are very stupid, we're gonna see a 50% error rate from that shard. In reality, our load balances probably aren't very stupid as they might start sending a traffic to the instance that is healthy. Though this has other um, implications because we're gonna like double the traffic going to that um, instance and we might see it die and have a cascading failure which would be very fun. So that's the very basics of uh, what a sharded service is and these are the terminologies I'm gonna use uh, throughout this talk. Shards, uh, instances, and replicas, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is some things I'm gonna do a little bit differently. So I've been talking about services and instances of services. Uh, an instance of a service, I think most of us 
consider a replica or a, uh, sorry, consider a bunch of Linux processes that can answer queries. Uh, and in a world like Kubernetes, we might call that a pod. In other schedules, we might call it a container. I'm going to use the term task. Uh, this is just because at Facebook, we call them tasks. And I am really bad at saying the word containers when I practice this. It was either container or task uh, completely randomly, which is very confusing. So I'm going to use the word task. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to number them. This isn't the case in some schedules like Kubernetes where tasks don't have an ID, but in Facebook we do give each of our tasks an ID. So if we have a job which has 20 tasks, they are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I've gone for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 without the 0, but whatever. It's all the same concept. So, um, yeah, I'm going to refer to them as task 1, task 2, task 3, and so on and so forth. So let's go over some of the theory of like how, I can, how we view shard services. So on our tasks, we have replicas of shards. So here, task one has the ability to respond to requests that concern shard one. And that means it has a replica of shard one. The same as task two, which has a replica of shard two, and so on and so forth. Uh, task three has a replica of shard two, and so on and so forth. The other thing is, uh, tasks can contain multiple copies of, sorry, multiple shards. So in this instance, uh, task one can respond to queries for shard one and shard three, which means it has a replica of those two uh, shards. And this is like, not always the case, so there are many systems out there where a single task is responsible for a single shard, but for services like Elasticsearch, for example, uh, this is very, very common. I'm going to use Elasticsearch as a common uh, example throughout this talk because uh, I used to run a cluster of Elasticsearch um, jobs on Facebook's uh, scheduler, Tupperware. So uh, what does it mean if one of these tasks goes unhealthy? Well. Tasks go unhealthy quite a lot, and when a task goes unhealthy, we usually think the process is dying or the process is unable to serve traffic. And this implicitly means that we cannot um, serve traffic to those shards, so those shards are what I call unhealthy. Unhealthy being we're unable to get responses for the queries that concern those uh, shards on that task. And this means, you know, as we showed the graphs before, we're going to see like a 33% a error rate on those individual shards because we've lost, you know, those replicas. But the other thing here is that shards can go on, sorry, replicas of shards can become unhealthy independently of the task of the, the health of the task. So, for example, if a shard uh, contains data that we are indexing from some other source, it might be that it becomes laggy, it might be that we have a corrupted disk, it might be that there are all kinds of weird things that can happen that mean we cannot serve queries for that shard. However, we might be able to serve queries for other shards that are on that task. So uh, if a, a, a task may be unable to serve traffic for a given shard that is on it, but be able to serve traffic for other uh, shards that are on it at the same time. Right, let's talk about schedulers. So schedulers are pretty popular nowadays. They seem to be the new big data, uh, which is very nice because I like schedulers and I like talking about them. Um, the basic concept of schedulers is that we have a mapping from hosts to tasks. So previously uh, in, well, in a lot of companies around the world still, but also like most companies going back 10 years, you would have a static mapping from hosts to what they do. So you might have a MySQL box, an Apache box, and so on and so forth. The basic concept of a scheduler is that we're going to relax that mapping and use hosts for different things at different times. So here I'm running uh, task one on host one. And the nice thing about relaxing that mapping is that we can handle failures a lot better. So if host one were to burst into flame, the scheduler can go and uh, understand what's going on here and maybe uh, do something to automatically resolve it. So when host one bursts into flame, it's probably going to follow that task one is going to become unhealthy. And the scheduler can see this because schedulers often do health checks against the tasks they run and can identify that, okay, host one has burst into flame. Uh, this probably means it cannot fulfill its responsibility to us to actually run this task successfully. Let's move this task and move the responsibility of running it over to host five, which is sitting there not doing anything interesting. So we tell host five, hey, go run task one, which means downloading the packages, starting up the process, and so on and so forth. We, uh, task one's been running over there successfully, and everything is wonderful because we've survived a host randomly dying without anything uh, too terrible happening. Now, and more importantly, no one has been woken up in the middle of the night to go fix a host. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because hosts bursting into flame is only one way that machines fail. It could totally be possible that 
the machine hasn't failed. It's just about to fail. It could be that we have a maintenance scheduled. It could be that we have temporary unavailability due to a network maintenance. There are all kinds of different reasons why uh, hosts might be unable to run tasks successfully. The key thing here, though, is that the scheduler has detected an issue and needs to move that task. It's the preemption, the move of that task, that actually matters. It could be that someone's run Tupperware drain at Facebook, or outside someone's run Coop control drain, or whatever. Most schedulers have these same primitives where we need to move the task off of a host. And this is the key problem of schedulers, because starting tasks is actually quite easy compared to stopping them. And particularly with sharded services, for some reasons I'm going to go into. So the first thing is, I talked about that mapping from uh, like username to uh, full name and other data we might need to, store, to respond to queries for a given shard. We need to store that data somewhere. And unfortunately, the answer is disks. And disks are a real pain. So these hosts that we're running on have disks, and we're going to use them to store data, which means that when I move task one from host one to host five, Suddenly, the data is no longer there. It's not as if the scheduler is like kind of logged in and been like, oh, oh, that, that I need to like, I'm going to file a ticket to someone in the data center to go and get this disk and move it from here to this host so that the service can have it when it starts up again on host five. That's really unrealistic. So services have to come up with ways to handle uh, the fact that disks uh, don't follow them often. And there are like, a number of different ways services handle this. So the most obvious one, uh, which a lot of services, particularly open source services, implement, is replication. So or just rebuilding data from replicas. So when we land on host 5, our disk is empty. But we know that elsewhere in the service, we have copies of that data. So we can copy that data over the network and reconstitute the data on the disk so that we have a working copy we can actually query and use to run our service. This is nice uh, in that it's very easy for an operator. I just start my service, and it magically pulls in data from wherever it needs in order to be able to run. However, it does kind of suck in many other ways. It's very slow, and it's very resource intensive. Disks are not infinite, but quite big nowadays, you know, 10, 14 terabytes. And that means I have to clone a lot of data over the network if I want to do this. So this kind of replication can cause a lot of churn and be really, really painful, which is why services have other ways of dealing with this. One of the most common ways I sometimes see is living through the fire. So if uh, that host is caught on fire, but someone is going to come along with a fire extinguisher and kind of put it out, and things are going to go back to how they were, if this is a temporary unavailability, then one way to handle this is literally just to sit on that host and say, well, I will come back soon. I will come back in a time that is uh, shorter than the time it would take me to copy this data across the network and create a new instance. And so it might be completely plausible that we just sit there and wait for uh, the unavailability to finish. And when it finishes, we'll come back with that full copy of data. It might be a little stale, and we might have to do some work to keep it up to date. But it will be potentially faster than copying across the network. The other way, which is very, very common in uh, cloud providers, is to have your uh, disk somewhere that isn't your host. So that sounds a little kind of intuitive, but the basic idea is that the ability to run the service, to have that CPU and memory that is running the service, doesn't necessarily need to be on the same host as the host which has the disk. It could be that we're going across the network, which is essentially what Amazon's uh, Elastic Block Store does, uh, to get any of that data from a disk. This can have big latency implications, but it's also a massive operational win. Because when I move task one from host one to host five, I can simply move the, uh, sorry, uh, task one can simply go to the same place as it was when it was running on host one to get uh, the disk, the data from the disk. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, now, when we usually perform operations via the scheduler, it's very easy for us to just uh, move stuff around. And it, I think our dream world of schedulers is, is having stuff move all around and the uh, scheduler working to give us a healthy fleet of hosts and a healthy fleet of services running on top of that host. However, sharded services can make this significantly different. So the basic concept is something like this. If I want to move um, task one from host one to host five for whatever reason, I need to go through a process of stopping it on, task, on host one and starting on host five. Now, it could be that we start it on host five and then stop it on task one, on host one later. But this actually has issues around having multiple copies and also capacity issues occasionally. What we are more likely to do is stop it on host one and then start it on host five. So 
This is fine usually. I, I, in this situation, I could just stop, because everything here is healthy, I can just stop the task one on host one and start it up again on host five. The issue comes when we have other shards or tasks that are unhealthy. So in this situation, I want to move host, uh, task one from host one to host five, but I have a replica of shard one on host two that is unhealthy. What does this mean? Well, the state we're in now is actually kind of okay because we have a replica of shard one available that we can actually, is serving traffic. And the final state is okay because we have, again, a replica of um, shard one that's available and can serve traffic. The issue comes in this intermediate state where we might be stopping one of these tasks or starting another one of these tasks, and we're not sure whether or not we'll always have a replica of shard one available in order to serve traffic. And if we ever go through a state where we don't have a replica of shard one available to serve traffic, it's likely we'll see a, you know, a really significant error rate. And if we're certain databases, we might require human intervention or like other automation uh, to uh, fix. And the basic issue is, uh, we can totally be in this state where we only have uh, that one broken instance of shard one running off task two. However, if we look at something like this, where uh, there is a replica unavailable, but it's now a replica of shard two, um, we're going to be in somewhat different state because we're going to we can stop task one and we'll see something like this, and we still have replicas of both uh, shards available. And when we start it up again, uh, we're still you know pretty great. So the key thing uh, here is that uh, shards mean that not all tasks are equal when it comes to safety. Some tasks can be required, some tasks aren't required, and this plays into the scheduler side of things. And schedulers need to actually understand this in order to make correct decisions around schedule. So what primitives do we get from schedulers nowadays? So I went onto the, web, uh, the Kubernetes website and some other scheduler website, and I uh, tried to construct some straw men and read their documentation to understand what the hell like how the hell they do this stuff. And all of this is like not recommended. And I'm sure this isn't the proper way to do it. But this is what I got from reading documentation. The most basic way, the most, probably the most incorrect way that I think most people would not do, uh, uh, not run a service on Kubernetes for, let's say a sharded service, sorry, on Kubernetes, is simply to run it in a deployment. A deployment just spins up n tasks. And when we do an update, we say, hey, how many tasks, sorry, how many containers, pods, whatever, can it take down at a single time? And I set two here as a kind of a straw man. So uh, this works okay in this example because we can see that we're going to take down two tasks, but we're still going to have a uh, replica of shard one available because we have three replicas overall and we've only taken two down. But this doesn't work when we have unavailability in an individual replica independent of the uh, health of the task. And this is where Kubernetes doesn't have uh, visibility onto the individual health of the shards. Uh, and so it can't make the optimal, the optimal uh, update decision, I guess. So uh, this is also a thing for Nomad, uh, which, I, yeah, is another scheduler. Uh, but this applies to basically all open source schedulers. Now, Kubernetes has some other ways to deal with this. So Kubernetes operators are a thing. Uh, the basic idea of an operator is your service is a little bit weird, and it doesn't totally fit into the default uh, Kubernetes model. Let's let you run it yourself, essentially, using Kubernetes infrastructure. So the operator will create some kube resources, which will essentially say, tell Kubernetes, hey, run a pod on this machine, run a pod over here, or whatever. This basically works by the operator reading the state of the service and then being responsible for the mapping from hosts to tasks and gives it a lot more control over how to uh, you know, execute or uh, how to manage the sharded service. Let's talk about, uh, about like, the key things we got from this. Shards can fail, sorry, replicas of shards can fail independent of task health. It can be dynamic and fail at any random time. Different services have different levels of safety. One might want one shard available, one might want one uh, service might want a majority of replicas of shards available. And all of this play, means that schedulers don't have the information they need to make uh, correct and safe decisions. So uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit how Facebook approached this problem. Uh, and I, uh, it's uh, not something we've unfortunately open sourced, but I really hope people can go and build something similar for open source schedulers. So uh, the basic issue when you still it is this. On the one hand, schedulers are really good at some things. Schedulers care about machines. In fact, I think that's the primary thing they care about. They are very bad about caring about humans, but they care a lot about machines. And they're very good at working out when machines are unhappy terrible at working out when humans are unhappy. 
they also care about updates. So um, people want to do stuff with schedulers. It's not just updates, it's also drains and other human uh, triggered uh, automation, or sorry, other human triggered operations. And they also care about things like maintenances, which can be both human and not human. Uh, and the difference between updates and maintenance is that maintenances often come from maybe your service provider or your people in the data center, whereas updates come from the people who own the services, the service owners. On the other hand, services really care about one thing more than anything else, which is answering requests correctly, quickly, and you know, efficiently. They do care about operations. They have some things like backups and so on that they might need to do, but these are all service-level operations. They're not machine-level operations. And they also care about shards, because unfortunately shards are a reality of how to run a stateful service, so we uh, often have to think about the allocation and so on of shards. So how do we uh, blend these two worlds? What are the challenges in uh, bridging the gap between the scheduler's concerns and the service's concerns? Well, one real thing is the diversity of services. It might be that the scheduler is running MySQL, and we have to understand MySQL's view of the world and what MySQL cares about in order to be able to make the right decisions. It might be that we're running Elasticsearch, and Elasticsearch is using HTTP instead of MySQL's MySQL protocol. And so we need to bridge these two worlds in some kind of protocol that works uh, well enough for both the Elasticsearch protocol and data model, more importantly, and the MySQL data model. Or it could be my cool service that I wrote yesterday and deployed to production this morning. There is a massive diversity of services we need to deal with. So we need some kind of protocol that's sufficiently generic and doesn't prescribe that much, uh, like data model or whatever, uh, on the service so that we can use it for this vast array of services we're running. So the enter task control. And this is why I'm using the word task, not containers, because it would be container control, and that's not the name of the protocol. So if you Googled it, you wouldn't find anything at all. But anyway, let's go through the basics of uh, task control. So uh, the basic idea is we want to give the service the power to determine the order and the timing of operations the scheduler wants to execute. So the scheduler wants to move task one from host one to host five, and it is going to ask the service, is this safe? As in, can I do this now, or should I do it later? And those are the only two responses the scheduler, or the service can reply to the scheduler. So the service might have some kind of unavailability going on. It will say, hey, I can't do that right now. And then in a little while, usually about 30 seconds, uh, it will, the scheduler will come back and say, hey, I'd still like to move uh, task one from host one to host five. And if you don't, we're going to have serious issues because you know, I do actually need to like, drain or do some maintenance or whatever. And the service, the state may have changed, and it may be able to say, OK, sure, go ahead. You can do that now. And it's not just task moves, though that is one of the most interesting and important uh, operations that can go on. It's also about updates. So it might be this, the uh, service wants to do updates in some weird form. It might be stopping and draining this task. It might be we want to uh, do something weird when we stop a task for the last time. It might be restarts, which in my mind are very similar to updates, but actually it might be an update is somewhat different from a restart. And it might be starting a new instance of the service. Most instances, most services, sorry, are very easy to start new instances of. But you do come across services sometimes where they say things like, oh, you can only ever have five instances of the service uh, starting up because we load our data from some backing store. And if we have more than five instances, we might cause errors for them or whatever. So let's run through a little example of how this actually works because it's a little bit abstract in the way I just described it. So I want to move uh, task one from host one to host five. Uh, what does this actually mean for the service? Well, the service, if it's sharded, it'll go look up what its uh, mapping of tasks to replicas looks like, and it will uh, begin to understand, like, okay, we have one instance of this replica that's unhealthy. Can, like, what does it look like if we were to actually do that move and have unavailability in task one? And that looks a little bit like this. And we're going to see the uh, task one and task, sorry, are the replicas on task one are unhealthy. And we only have a single instance of shard one that is healthy. We're going to identify that. And the service gets to make a decision about whether or not that is an acceptable state to be in. Uh, I've used, uh, so in most services, that they want to have more than one replica always available. And so it's going to reply to the scheduler, nope, can't do that right now. After some time, we're going to see uh, the scheduler is going to come back and say, hey, uh, I'd still like to do that move, and we're going to hope that the state of the service has changed somewhat, or maybe the service has taken action in order to uh, remediate the issue we had before. Previously, we had uh, the replica of shard one on task three that was unhealthy, 
and we've maybe done some operations, moved some resources around, and now we're in a slightly different state. And if we would say, okay, cool, can I take down task one now? Well, if we look at uh, the shard one, uh, we're gonna see we have two heavy replicas now, and so we're gonna say, hey, yeah, sure, go ahead, it's all fine, everything is wonderful now. So um, this is what we use at Facebook to uh, run, this is the basic protocol we use to run uh, sharded services and in weird and interesting services on top of Tupperware, our scheduler. We published a blog post very recently about this. Uh, it's very interesting just beyond uh, task control, but also looking at the fact that we have you know, multiple data centers running one of the biggest schedulers in the world, and some of the uh, design decisions, architecture decisions we made when uh, designing that scheduler. I should also say, I don't work on the scheduler team. The people who wrote that blog post are kind of amazing, and their team is amazing, and uh, I'm not taking credit for this. They're very good. Uh, go read the blog post. Cool, uh, I'm gonna go through some uh, the co corollaries of this uh, because it does, it's quite different from how uh, some, like the operator form of uh, running charity services in Kubernetes, uh, and it has some consequences. So one of the things I like the most about this is that um, we have a fairly well-defined flow in uh, schedulers about how operations or inputs are given to the scheduler. So if I am a facilities engineer or something and I need to drain a rack or row or a data center, I say to the scheduler, hey, uh, we, we've got an issue, we need to actually drain this. Please go and move the tasks away from it. And so the automation and operators and users or whatever come into the top of the scheduler and then that the scheduler then impacts the service below it. And this is exactly the same in task control. The scheduler talks to the task control, and the task control say, yes, do it now or do it later, but it can't say no. So the, the control flow is still down, and the ta task controller is still uh, deferring to the scheduler for its inputs. This also means that if I'm an operator, I don't need to really care too much about what is running on the thing I'm draining. If it is a service, I talk to the scheduler. If it is a task control-based service, I talk to the scheduler. Everything flows the same way, and we provide a moderately uniform interface. In reality, task control jobs can actually delay drains and cause issues, so the user, this, the user, if things go badly, may find out whether or not we have a task controller running here, but in general, the user should not care too much. And so, yeah, we've got the basic fact that the control flow is exactly the same, and we can slot this into our existing automation without too much worry. The other thing is here is you can do random stuff. So because the scheduler is making a call to the service, and that call is just an arbitrary um, like thrift call for us, that's equivalent to gRPC or HTTP REST, uh, it's an arbitrary call, and the service can implement whatever it wants to respond to that request. We can do a lot of fun stuff. It could be that we want to drain a host before we allow the scheduler to go and kill it. It could be that we want to say, okay, don't put any new shards on top of that if we have dynamic shard allocation and shards are moving around. And it could be that we want to like, send a message to a human because people write services in very odd ways and services are incredibly diverse. It could be that somebody needs to you know, create a crown of chorizanthemum and uh, do a ritual dance in order to drain their service. And if they want to, they can actually do that this way. So, but we don't really want people to do that. And we want to create some common uh, frameworks in order to uh, you know, ex implement these task controllers. The, one of the issues with task control is that it's a very dangerous protocol. If you mess up one way, you end up blocking drains and preventing maintenance is happening and making people very unhappy mostly scheduler and data center engineers and that kind of thing. If you go the other way, you end up allowing too many tasks to happen and you end up making your team very unhappy because you've just taken down their service through what you thought was a cool hack to make the scheduler a bit smarter. So what we want to do is build common frameworks in order to allow people to write uh, task controllers easily and safely. And there are a few questions we need to ask when we're doing this. So one of the big ones is allocation. Some services, uh, oh, sorry, the allocation of shards is the mapping from replicas to the tasks they're running on. It doesn't have to be that in this diagram here, I have shard one and shard two running on task three. It could be in some services that this is preordained and this is the only sane way to run this thing and it is in config file somewhere. It could be in other services that this is dynamic and it's stored in some database somewhere and we can update it at runtime. There are all kinds of different ways this can be executed, but one of the really big ones is can we change this at runtime? And that's a child allocation. So when I gave this example before, we decided that uh, we couldn't uh, restart task one because then we'd only have a single replica of uh, shard one available. 
But there are ways around this if we control the allocation of shards to tasks dynamically. We can just move our, uh, move our uh, tasks to, sorry, move our replicas to other tasks and make, get to a state where task one has nothing running on it. And when task one has nothing running on it, it's very safe for us to restart it because it has no significance to the overall health of the service. And this looks something like this. Uh, we say, hey, uh, Char Manager, this, is a, uh, this framework is called Char Manager. Uh, I don't think we've published very much about it, unfortunately. When I Googled it, I just found a patent. It's uh, basically a framework to allow people to build Charter services without having to re-implement the world every single time. Anyway, we say to Char Manager, hey, I would like to stop task one. And Shard Manager can say to the service and work with it because it's a framework that is actually embedded in these sharded services of Facebook. Hey, move your shards off of T1 and it can work with the service to make sure that happens. It doesn't have to though because it could be that there are very good reasons why we can't move shards off of T1 and we can take other approaches. So this is where we get into uh, services where we can't control allocation. And services where we can't control allocation are often the long tail and uh, they have some properties they're often weird. Um, so services are very, very often weird because there's such a diversity, and sharded services suffer from weirdness more than others. But some services aren't weird. And to me, a non-weird service is basically, it uses a replica and shard model. There are sharded services out there that don't look like this, and they have things like 2.5 replica replicas for every shard, which is very painful to deal with, but most of them don't. And generally, they have the concept of safety of, I want to have always at least this many replicas up, or not this, make sure we don't have this many replicas unhealthy. And in these cases, we can implement a slightly different task controller that, doesn't, that still works for services that don't control allocation, but uh, aren't super, super weird. And this is uh, shard task control, which is a little thing we, I wrote to uh, you know, make Elasticsearch work a lot better on uh, Tupperware, but also, has also been picked up by various other services at Facebook. So the basic idea here is that we run that safety check we talked about before. We'd like to stop task one, or do an update, or do a move, or whatever, and uh, we want what information do we need to evaluate if we can do this safely. The basic idea is this. It's this mapping of uh, tasks to shards and the, the health of those replicas on those tasks. And so we simply just ask uh, the service for that mapping. It looks a little bit like this. Uh, and then we can run the simulation of what does the world look like if task one was to go down. It looks at something like this. And previously, we identified shard one uh, on task two as having only a single replica available and therefore being in a dangerous state. However, that's a bit of an assumption, and different services have different uh, constraints on the availability of their shards. And this is where we ask the service the second uh, piece of information we need, which is, what are your constraints? And here it's, uh, we always need to have at least two shards, uh, sorry, two replicas per shard healthy. And so we look here and we see that, oh, look, we only have a single uh, instance of shard one healthy. This is not going to cut it. And so we're going to say to the scheduler, sorry, that's not possible for us to do right now. This is pretty useful also particularly for updates. So in a world where um, often when people build very simple services, they build them so that they have a single replica per task uh, and then they have like two replicas of every shard. And when you do an update of this, if we go in the normal form, then we update one, then we wait for it to come back. We update the second, and we wait for it to come back. And then we update the third, and we wait for it to come back. We essentially can only do one at a time. And this means updates are very slow. However, if we understand the shards, we can go much faster. So in this question, mm -hmm. OK, so uh, if we want to execute uh, an update of all of these tasks, we can say, right, can I stop task one? And the answer is yes, because we have replicas of everything else. Now, we know we, stop, we want to stop task one. Can I stop task two? And the answer is no, because we can see that Assuming we stop task one, we're not going to have a replica of shard one available if we stop task two. So we say no, and we undo that, and we ask, can we stop task three? And the answer is yes, because we have that replica of uh, shard two available on task four. Can, uh, can we stop task four? And the answer is no, because uh, we won't have any replicas of shard two available. Can we stop task uh, five? Well, no, because we only have a single replica of shard three, so I guess we're never going to update that task. But you get the basic idea that we're now able to update multiple tasks at the same time, and we can in increase the speed of these updates massively instead of updating one at a time. Now, the other thing here is that um, these are two frameworks that uh, we use. Job Manager is incredibly popular and used for 
a large proportion of the state for services at Facebook. Shout task control is used for the weird ones that aren't super, super weird. But for the super, super weird ones, they can just do whatever they want. So um, one, like when we say, oh, I'd like to update this job, sometimes what we want to do is just say, all right, screw it. We, we can't even think about the availability. This job doesn't do rolling updates. We're just going to take everything down at once and bring it back up. It might be that if we are like draining a rack, then we want to do something a bit smarter, but we want the special case updates to do something like this. And this is really common because, again, Elasticsearch is really painful to do rolling updates for if you haven't got the right configuration. So sometimes this is the right thing to do. And it's all very, very simple. And this gives a ton of power. And in, in my mind, this is the real, uh, the real fun of engineering is trade-offs around power and capabilities that we give to services. The task control interface, when I showed this to like a friend uh, who works in the open source world, he said, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is powerful enough to actually allow us to uh, run whatever shadow service we need. But when I showed it to some people internally, they said, oh, I'm not sure. This is really dangerous. We're giving people the power to block drains and cause all kinds of issues. These things are very scary. And they're often worked around, and we can find good compromises. But every organization has a different level of power they're willing to give to service owners to be weird. And so this is the level we're happy with, I guess. But for other services, for example, if you run in a cloud and you're quite small, the scope of damage could be limited. And so it might be you're willing to give more power to people. On the other hand, if you're running in a very large data center, you might want to take power away from people. But there is a lot of things you can't do with task control, even though internally at Facebook we think this is an incredibly powerful interface. You can't talk about allocation at all. So when I say, hey, I'd like to move task one from host one to host five, host five isn't something I get to choose. I don't get to say, hey, I want to run on that host over there. The scheduler does that for me. This is like actually a really big deal because it means the scheduler needs to be able to be configured to do what you need anyway. We don't allow you to talk about like <laughs> we don't allow you to combine things and add new maintenances in and do kind of additional things. For example, when someone says, "I would like to stop this job." The uh, service might like say, you want to stop this job? Great. I'm also going to stop these other ones at the same time. But in reality, like, that's not something task control allows you to do. It only allows you to say yes or later. So we don't allow you to add in additional operations such as, oh, you're doing an update? I'm just going to squeeze a quick maintenance in there. Or, oh, you're doing an update? Well, we've been meaning to drain this rack for a while. Let's do that at the same time as this update because we're going to go down anyway. It doesn't allow you to configure weird dynamic things about the service. For example, most schedulers run, or most agents or hosts, uh, when they're running a task or a container, they stop tasks in the form of, I'm going to send you a signal, I'm going to wait a bit, and then I'm going to send you another signal. That's not the kind of thing we allow you to do via task control. But for many services and many jobs, that might be very useful. And there are organizations out there which is very, like, which where this would be very, very useful. So, all of that is to say, um, this is a pretty nice way for us to be able to uh, implement uh, shared services on top of schedulers. We think it's proved fairly successful that it has limitations, and some of those are intentional because we want to restrict power or give power to service owners. And uh, it would be really cool to see more of this in the open source world. The basic concept we're talking about here is uh, giving power to services. But beyond that, there's also ideas around could we make schedulers aware of sharded services? Could we make uh, health checks aware of sharded services? And could we encode support for sharded services into more of the base primitives of schedulers? So uh, all of those say, someone please go and build this for Kubernetes. Any questions? <laughs> Hello, Laurie. This mic it's is not on. not on. No. Hello. Nope. No? Can we get the mic on? Oh, now I'm much louder again. Uh, excellent. Uh, so, hello. I no definitely way. don't know you. Uh, how, how does one validate the correctness of the, these, uh, these configurations as a service owner? Because if I'm, well, I, I now am an ignorant service owner. Uh, and I don't understand how this kind of stuff works, but you know, I have a lot of opinions about task control. I, I want to do stuff, but how do I, assuming I'm well-intentioned, how do I even validate, hey, I've, I've actually made something which somewhat makes sense and it will say yes or later at the right times and is not liable to take the site down or whatever? 
uh, so I think it's a generally, genuinely hard problem. So um, one thing I've been meaning to do is build like a suite of tests for this so that we can run common operations over, uh, over your service. But in reality, because task control often depends on the state of your service and often the parties, well, second party services that your service depends on, it can actually be very hard to test every single situation. However, there are basic things like your service should be able to update, your service should be able to restart, your service should be able to move off of a rack that yet yeah, are worth testing. And I've been meaning to like build a bash script to basically run the commands that would trigger all of those different situations. Uh, but I don't believe we have one right now. Beyond that, I think there's a real thing of failing safer. So um, when your task controller is unable to do something or do the right thing when it gets a random error, do you want it to say, oh, okay, whatever, just, just do the operation, do the restart? Or do you want it to say, oh, okay, well, we're just not going to do anything, like do this later? And the answer is later is a quite a, a reasonable uh, response. You do need alerting and so on and so forth to make sure that, oh, this job has been trying to restart for a week. Uh, maybe we should like check why. But uh, in reality, failing closed is actually a very good safety net. Beyond that, I could talk a little about logging. Like uh, generally, when you log things and this kind of thing, there are two two kinds of things that happen: something errors, or you allow something to happen. When you allow something to happen, you can log like a reason. Say this is why I let this task move from here to here, and that's super useful because if something goes bad, it's usually because you allowed something to happen. So having a reason is very useful. Uh, but that's not exactly the same as correctness. I think the reality is though we don't have a good test suite and like having test suites for this stuff is very important. The reason uh, we have common frameworks is because if you mess this stuff up, it's really scary. Uh, and also like it's a little bit why I'm skeptical of the Kubernetes operator approach because it gives, uh, it doesn't give a framework, it gives a, uh, a set of tools that you can construct a correct system from, but you won't necessarily do so. Thank you, I definitely won't do so, so thank you. Uh, one question here, the talk was splendid. So did you explore any other open source workflow as a service, say for example, something like an Apache Airflow and then my application just integrating with that to control my tasks or uh, how is it different? Yeah, so um, I think it's worth saying the stage of what Tupper is. So I'm not gonna say it's really large scale, therefore we have to do everything weird. That's slightly true, but, it, but that's not a good answer. Um, one thing I care a lot about is the fact that this is at the bottom of the system. All of Facebook or like a lot of Facebook runs on Tupperware, and if it breaks, uh, we have real, really big issues. Uh, like we, the site won't work. Um, so it's really important this stuff is fairly dependency free because we are sitting in the critical path of updates, of uh, drains, and of all kinds of things. So when it comes, like if we need to get out of a data center quickly, if we need to get out of a row quickly, then it's really uh, important that this stuff works, even if the rest of the service is in the degraded state. Sorry. So this actually goes back to Chris's question, which is uh, how do you test this and how do you like, make sure things don't go really badly? Because it's an interesting situation where if you, the service and the general like, ecosystem of Facebook services are in a bad state, we want to both be able to, we need to give a correct response because this stuff is often sitting in the way of us resolving that issue. But at the same time, uh, at the same time, like we want to fail close, and we want to be very careful, and like so on. So um, you totally could build something on top of whatever, like open source or non open source, like a workflow engine or whatever makes sense. But my because this is low in the stack and because it's very critical, my tendency is to favor the simple and the dependency free wherever possible. Does that make sense? Got it. Thanks. Awesome. Oh. Okay. Uh, just one question regarding the resource management, like. Let us say that scheduler tasks some task. Some of the tasks may be CPU intensive. Some of the tasks may be I/O bound. Like sometimes you need to give the flexibility to increase it. Sometimes you should. It's like how exactly are doing the resource management from your side? Go read that blog post. But uh, basic idea is that okay. So the scheduler, as I've talked about, is in the critical path of everything. We want to make it as simple as possible. Uh, we do provide CPU limits and we like make sure that stuff doesn't go too crazy. But when it comes to balancing resources and making sure we have like an even spread and we don't have like super hot CPU in this rack and super hot network in this rack, uh, the scheduler doesn't care. However, there are other systems that can look at that kind of stuff and balance it. And we call it rebalance, right? I believe we talk about it in that blog post. Uh, and so yeah, it's not sitting in the critical path. It means the scheduler can be simpler, which is amazing because schedulers are really complicated. Uh, and it 
generally works, though it isn't as fast or as like immediate and doesn't give the same guarantees that we might have if we were to move it into the scheduler. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, thanks for listening.